Comes Hollywood Theater presents Mr. Frank Lovejoy in Boiler Room. There are two kinds of boiler rooms, and this was the other kind. The kind you find out about from a key forward committee. By the time I got wise to what was going on, they turned the heat on me. And by that time, I'd been marked for killing. Welcome to the Tums Hollywood Theater. Tales of suspense, thrills, adventure. Brought to you by Tums. Take Tums. Tums for the tummy. Don't let acid indigestion get you down. Get Tums. Tums for the tummy. Always keep that handy little roll around. Eat what you like. Don't let heartburn strike. Get T-U-M-S. Tums. Like well-seasoned foods? Sure, we all do. Well, you may eat them without fear of acid indigestion because Tums quickly soothe and settle acid-upset stomach, ease heartburn away. You feel better fast. Get Tums tonight. Now, here's the Tums Hollywood Theater presentation of Boiler Room, starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy. There's a sucker born every minute. Maybe you don't believe that, but there are still plenty of guys that do. Yep. And when you try to prove they're wrong like I did, anything can happen. Like having your head blown off. All right, so I should have known better. I should have known that something was fishy. Fishy is a killer whale when they let me in right away to see this Jason Corbett. Tycoon Corbett just wasn't that accessible to guys like me. No, not even with the letter of introduction that I've been able to wangle. And yet, there he sat as though he was listening to the chairman of his board of directors. And hadn't I heard him tell his secretary that we weren't to be interrupted under any circumstances? But like a fool, all I did about it was sit there and wonder what goes here. What goes? Herriman? Yes, sir? Letter here says you once served with the OSS in Germany. Is a major. Oh, yes, but that's ancient. Resourcefulness could have come through that. Oh, thank you. And courage. You'd need plenty of that, too. Look, uh, Mr. Corbett, I came here to apply for a job in your personnel department. Huh? Oh, sorry. No openings. Oh, well, much as I'd love to stay and chat... Sit down. I beg your pardon? Sit down. I'm about to make you a proposition. What kind of proposition? One involving $5,000. Hmm. Uh, you were saying, Mr. Corbett? In confidence. Strictest confidence, you understand. Well, if it's murder, you better take somebody else into your confidence. Naturally, it's nothing of the sort. Go on. Well, I... I have a daughter, Diane. That photograph at your elbow? No, no. That's my wife. My second wife, of course. I was a widower for 15 years, and then six months ago, uh, this uh, other photograph is my daughter, Diane. So? I know what you're thinking, that only an old fool, and yet I've been supremely happy in my marriage. No one has ever been able to breathe a word against my young wife. We're digressing. Well, not entirely, by which I mean having a wife almost as young as one's daughter does make things awkward. With the daughter? No, not that she's ever said or done anything openly. Matter of fact, she tried to make things appear quite the reverse, but I can sense how she really feels. And what makes it worse is that my daughter and I had always been so close. Now, Mr. Corbett, I still can't figure where I come in. It's this way, Harriman. Lately, my daughter has been going out with a man named Carl Beck. Runs a boiler room. Oh? You know what kind of a boiler room I mean? The kind that has no boilers. Just telephones, lots of them, with solicitors phoning suckerless of people to raise money for all kinds of promotions. Hmm. You know the boiler room operation, all right? Yes, I do. Well, imagine my daughter being interested in the man who runs one. Maybe he's more legitimate than most. Carl Beck is a blackmailer of the worst sort. Can you prove that? 
If I could, would I be offering you $5,000? I see. You want me to expose this man as a blackmailer in order to break up your daughter's romance with him? It's the only way I can protect her. I'm afraid if I even try to talk to her about Beck. Well, you see, I didn't exactly consult her when I married Grace. Well, why pick on me? Why don't you just hire a private eye? I did. Beck spotted him right away. Probably spot me, too, then. No, no. You're a stranger in town, for one thing. For another, we'll take a look at your record. I think you're a match for Beck. How about it? Well, first, what makes you think he's a blackmailer? That boiler room could never earn him the kind of money he spends. Is that all? Uh, Mr. Corbett, I'm walking out with the same $5 I brought in. I'll make it 10000 It isn't only the money. And if you succeed, I'll make an opening for you in personnel, if you still want it. Well, there's still something else. You see, I just broke up one romance, my own. Maybe this fellow will make your daughter a better husband than my wife considered me. Herman? Yeah. You can at least be honest. Honest? Well, you're turning me down because it's too hazardous, aren't you? If you mean I'm yellow... Let's say I misjudged you. You're needling me, Mr. Corbett. But just in case Carl Beck isn't a blackmailer, I'll take a thousand in advance. The Beck solicitation service consisted of a swanky office out front and a long barren room with a dozen desks and telephones in back. The public, to be sure, only saw the front and Carl Beck. It was easy enough to get past his blonde receptionist if you looked like a client. Now then, Mr. Harriman, if you'll explain your particular problem. Well, my problem, Mr. Beck, is that I need a job. This is not an employment agency. Well, I know what it is, all right. I work for Fielder out on the coast. Yeah? Why aren't you still working for him? The usual reason. Female gender. Well, Fielder passed through town just last week. He didn't say anything about you coming here. Last week, I didn't know it either. Hmm. Well, I happen to be full up right now, Harriman. You might try Minneapolis, maybe Kansas City. I was high man for Fielder nine weeks in a row, Beck. Over a phone, I sound like the president of the Junior Chamber of Commerce, and once I get a nibble, I never lose my fish. Oh, Diane. Oh, I'm sorry, Carl. The girl didn't tell me you were busy. Oh, I'm not. I, I'll be right with you, Diane. Goodbye, Harriman. Maybe we could talk some more later. I said goodbye. Let's go, Diane. I got a good look at the old man's daughter as I followed them into the reception room. She didn't look like the type that would go for a man like Beck, but then neither had my wife looked like the type that would run away with another woman's husband. And what about Beck's little blonde receptionist? What type was she? Maybe I ought to light a cigarette and find out why she was looking at me like that. So all you wanted was a job. I want a man's in my fix. What more can he want? There are plenty of places besides boiler rooms for a fellow with your personality. <laughs> Not if he wants to make my kind of money. Oh. And what do you do with it afterwards? Guess. Well, I just got paid. Maybe you could maybe you could show me tonight. Well, if you'll consider it a loan, Miss uh Just call me Faye. I don't know how soon I can pay you back, Faye. Well, maybe sooner than you think. It just happens that Carl the boss, that is. Kind of looks to me for advice. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you went to work for him after all. Next afternoon, I was working for the Beck Solicitation Service and finding out plenty for Mr. Jason Corbett. Work, did I say? You put on a set of headphones and wear out your right index finger, dialing, dialing, dialing. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, I'm calling you on behalf of the Friends of the Homeless. I'm sure you're well acquainted with this worthy organization and all the good it performs. Now, it happens that we're planning a Sunday outing for our protégés, and we're asking leading citizens like you to help defray the expenses. Now, let me see. We have you down for the nominal sum of $25. Well, then, we'll make it ten. Uh, five. Well, thank you, Mr. Stebbins. We'll have someone there to pick up your check within the hour. (laughs) 
The Friends of the Homeless and other such outfits got 40% of the take. The other 60% was split between Beck and the solicitor. It was enough to turn a man's stomach. Otherwise, I thought I was getting by okay until a week later. When Beck sent for me. Sit down, Harriman. Nothing wrong, I hope. So do I. The reason I sent for you, though, was uh, to try you out on a new pitch. Oh? Mm-hmm. We're going to promote a centennial book for the uh, Pontica Pioneer Society. Pontica? What sort of a setup do they have? Well, how do I know? I never heard of them before. All that concerns you is that we're socking each sponsor a C note. Wow. And for this, they get what? Their name on the back of the book, with all the other names. At a hundred bucks a crack? Yeah. <laughs> really ought to clean up on this. <laughs> Now, here's a list for you to start on. Let's see who we got on top there. Oh, yes. Jason Corbett. Jason Corbett. He runs the big Corbett Corporation, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. I thought you might have heard of him. I'll go right in and call him. Yeah, wait. Use my phone. Ah, oh, but Mr. Beck... I'll be listening on the extension so I can uh, analyze just what happens. You understand? This is a test. Yeah, I get it. This is office number? No, he should be home now. He... Hold it. Hello? Oh, will you please tell Mr. Corbett the Pontica Pioneer Society is calling? Oh, he isn't in just now, but this is Mrs. Corbett. Perhaps I can help you. Well, thank you. No, Mrs. Corbett, I'm afraid... If it's about a donation... Well, it happens to be about our centennial book. We're asking the leading citizens of How the... How much? Well, it's uh, $100, of course. The name I'll of... I'll send you my personal check. Suppose I make it out to the Beck Solicitation Service. Why, yes. Very well, then. Goodbye. Satisfied, Mr. Beck? No. You see, Harriman, for the purposes of the uh, test, I wanted to hear you talk to Jason Corbett in person. Well, that showed me where I stood. Yes, Beck knew that Jason Corbett was trying to get him, and he had me tagged as the man with the mission. Which meant I was going to have to get something definite on Beck, and fast. Conveniently, Beck had a date with Diane that night, so after my own date with Faye, I dropped in at the office with a strip of celluloid that had once opened a lot of Nazi doors. I had noticed that Beck kept his glass bookcases locked, and he didn't impress me as the sort who valued literature, especially poetry. I was curious about a boxed edition of the complete works of Tennyson. Could it have been hollowed out to contain something besides poetry? Stop! Stop! Uh, Mr. Corbett, this is Matt Harriman. Well? Is it all right to talk? Go on, go on. I just came from Beck's place. I had a hunch about where he was keeping something hidden. What do you mean, something? Well, letters, let's say. That's the stock and trade of most blackmailers. Harriman, you talk as though you didn't get them. Somebody shot at me, that's why. You mean Beck? No, no, this was a woman. Besides, Carl Beck wouldn't have used blanks. Uh, how do you know they were blanks? Because the shots came through a closed window and there was no shattered glass. This uh, woman here, ever see her before? No, and I wasn't able to follow her. She left the motor running in her car and got away too fast. By that time, of course, people were running from all directions, so I didn't dare go back inside. Uh, it's too bad here, man. But a nice little adventure proves that I was right. Yes, this woman who shot at you is the person he's blackmailing. She had to stop you from finding out uh, whatever it is that Carl Beck knows about her. Well, she sure succeeded. Only for the time being. You almost pulled it off, Harriman, and I have every confidence... It if I hear my wife moving about, I'd better hang up. Yeah, but Mr. Corbett, about Carl Beck... I... You'd better hang up now, too, Mr. Harriman. Oh. Well, I'm glad to meet you, Diane. About Carl Beck. I just left him at his office. He's very much disturbed. Imagine if he were to know, positively, that you are my father's spy. Diane. Beck is a blackmailer. The boiler room is only a front... 
It's for your own good. For your own good, Mr. Harriman, I'm giving you 24 hours to get out of town. Or I'll tell Carl Beck. In which case, you'll be dead. In just a moment, Act Two of Boiler Room, starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy. It's like magic, Mr. Wilson. Real, honest-to-goodness magic. You mean... I mean Tums. And their wonderful way of letting me sleep nights. My, when I think how acid indigestion used to keep me tossing and turning, tired out but wide awake... Yes, Tums have stopped that kind of misery for millions. You see, Tums are community. They give you such speedy, sweet relief. Tums soothe and relax your acid-upset stomach. Put it at ease so you can sleep. And the sleep that follows Tums is restful, natural sleep. I wake up mornings feeling spry as a kitten. Ah, uh, sure you do. Tums are convenient, too. Nothing to measure, mix, or stir. No water needed. Mm, I keep a roll of Tums handy on my bedside table and take them without even turning on the light. Hear that, friends? Get Tums tonight. T-U-M-S, Tums for the tummy. Still only ten cents a roll, three roll package a quarter on counters everywhere. Now, Act Two of Boiler Room, starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy. Twenty-four hours to get out of town. A good insurance risk wouldn't have waited twenty-four minutes. I'd been offered $10,000 to prove that a certain Carl Beck, operator of a so-called boiler room, was a blackmailer. Prove it so that Jason Corbett's debutante daughter, Diane, wouldn't have anything further to do with Beck. And yet, it was this same Diane confronted with the facts about him who had given me those 24 hours. Or else, she'd tell Beck. Sometimes when I can't figure a thing out, I sleep on it and wake up with the answer. This daybreak, I woke up with a cold muzzle in my ribs. All right, Harriman. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Beck, <sighs> it's a matter, boss, am I late for work? That Harriman is guaranteed to be the last clever thing you will say unless you tell me quick where it is. You know, you aren't going to believe this, of course, but I haven't the haziest notion of what it might be. No? Well, don't be so hazy about that bundle of letters you took last night. Oh, so that's what you had inside the boxed edition of Tennyson, the bundle of letters. And written by the woman who fired those blanks at me. <laughs> I can't help wondering, Beck, what's in those letters. For the last time, Harry... Now, look, if I was the one who took those letters, would I still be here? I'm not that much of a fool. Well, you were enough of a fool to think I wouldn't check with Fielder and find out that you never worked for him out on the coast. That wasn't foolishness. That was desperation. But only a low-grade idiot would hang around after he got what he wanted. So you're a low-grade idiot. Now going to give me those letters? Well, I'll do the next best thing. I'll tell you who can. Yeah? Only quit poking that thing in my ribs, because when I tell you who it is, you might start to twitch. And if there's anything I hate, it's being interrupted by a bullet. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's better. I think I know what you're going to say, Harriman. But you're going to have to give me proof. All right, in that case, I'll give you this. Oh, trick, sir. Just wait a little... Now, if you don't mind, I'll borrow the keys to your convertible. The bump on Beck's head could be a very temporary thing, so I had no time to waste. I headed out to the estate of Jason Corbett, but not to see the old man. It was his daughter I wanted to talk to. And under the circumstances, I wasn't bothering about the proprieties. I, uh, I seem to be very good at this sort of thing. I located your room on the very first try, Diane. If you don't get out of here this minute, ask him for help. Oh, I'd wake up dear old Dad, and I'll have to explain what led up to my presence here. You're very smug, aren't you? Well, there. Hmm. My lady sleeps with an automatic under her pillow. I could kill you and only have to tell the truth. What truth? That I woke to find an intruder in my room. Oh, you know something, Diane? 
First time I saw you, I just knew you didn't put your hair up in curlers every night or smear your face up like an Egyptian mummy. I will kill you if you don't get out of here. Well, first you'll have to explain why you frame me. Framed? Yes, by stealing that bundle of letters. The letters are gone. As if you didn't know. Oh, no, they can't be gone. Ask your boyfriend, Carl Beck. Gone. He thinks I took them, and I think you took them. Well, I, I didn't. Then it could only be the lady who fired the blank cartridges at me. Now, who is she? How should I know? My dear Diane. Look, this has gone far enough. Are you going to get out of here or... Uh -uh. Shh. Um, who is it? Gray. I thought you and your stepmother weren't very palsy well. Please. Um, what is it, Grace? Someone insists on seeing you. It's a Lieutenant Neely from the police. I didn't need any more urging to get out of there. Whatever the police wanted of Diane Corbett, I didn't want them asking questions of me, not yet. So I left by way of the second-story window and hurried to where I'd parked Beck's convertible. But a police car had pulled up alongside, so I elected to walk. And just before I got to my place, a car stopped for me. Faye. Quick, Matt. Jump in. Sure. What's the rush, Faye, at this hour? They found him, Matt. Carl Beck? And now they're looking for you. They were even at my apartment. The police? Half the force is working on the case. Oh, Matt, why didn't you get out of town as soon as it happened? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Just because I roughed up Carl He's Beck... He's dead, Matt. Dead? From a bump on the head? There's also a bullet in his heart. You're sure? I just came from there, didn't I? You mean he was found in my place? He's still there. Lieutenant Neely left word for the medical examiner to wait until he gets back. Faye. Last night, after I took you home, I dropped in at the office. While I was there, a woman shot at me with blank cartridges. I've got to find that woman. Don't try now, Matt, or the police will find you first. You've got to get out of town. But don't you see, When this Faye? has died down, you can come back and, and, and find your woman. And all the while, Matt, I'll be keeping my eyes and ears open. Faye, you've been... You've been too good to me right from the start. Wonder why. I want you to know that I'll never forget a thing. Where are we? Private airfield. They'll take you anywhere you want to go and no questions asked. Need any money, Matt? No, no, no. I owe you too much already. It was because I couldn't forget how much I owed Faye that I didn't take that plane ride. Instead, I hid out until dark and then sneaked back into town. Faye wasn't in when I got to her apartment, but that was the way I'd figured it. Matt! Matt Harriman! Ah, surprise. Well, I thought you were a thousand miles away. And this place, it looks like a cyclone hit it. Yeah, well, what it all means, Faye, is that I've finally managed to add things up and uh, get the right answers. Answers to what? Well, for instance, the very first thing that you did for me, getting Carbeck to hire me after he turned me down. It wasn't easy. Yet he did it for you. Why? Could it have been because your relationship with Beck had once been more than just that of office receptionist? All right. And then he went crazy over that Diane. Yes, exactly. But you wanted him back... You knew the only hold he had on Diane was those letters. They weren't her letters. No, they weren't. They were written by the woman of the blank cartridges, the woman who is now Mrs. Jason Corbett. She was afraid that if her husband ever read those old and, well, shall we say, indiscreet letters, she'd no longer be Mrs. Jason Corbett. As if that could possibly have anything to do with Diane. Diane was protecting Mrs. Corbett, even to the extent of going out with Carl Beck to keep him from being too ruthless. Interesting, if true. But why tell me all this? Well, to account for the last thing you did for me. Help me run away so the police would be sure that I had shot Carl Beck. Whereas, in fact, you had. I? Sure, because Beck had already begun to suspect the truth. That the letters were stolen by you. Well, why would I steal them? Because it would take away the only hold Beck had over Diane. You'd have a clear field with him again. You don't really think the police will believe that cockeyed story? Well, they will, after I show them the letters. No. Took a lot of looking, but I finally found where you'd... Oh, no, you, you don't. You meddling fool! Drop that gun. Okay, okay, break it up. Lieutenant Neely. Funny thing about hunches, every once in a while they pay off. Only in this case, it was Miss Corbett's. Hello, Diane. He Hello, Matt. 
Harriman, I'd better take a blonde down to the lockup. Mosey along and see me after a while, will you? Oh, sure thing. Oh, and uh, about those letters. I don't think we'll have to bring them up at the trial, but I'd better have them anyway. Where are they? Well, the fact is, Lieutenant, I couldn't find them. Why, you dirty... We'll find them if we have to reduce this place to rubble. Come along, you. Look, Neely, if you'll let me cop a police... No dice, sister. Matt? Yeah. What are you going to tell my father? Well, that he owes me the rest of that 10000 and the job and personnel. Even though I wasn't able to find out who was being blackmailed by the late Carl Beck. Oh. Well, I... Uh, I suppose I'd better go now. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait just a minute. Here. You better take this bundle of letters with you and burn them. Frank Lovejoy will return in just a moment. Have you got a great big major worry or just a lot of little ones? Either way, watch out for acid upset stomach. You see, when you worry, your worry nerve acts directly on your tummy, starts it pumping bitter, burning acid. Then comes a spell of acid indigestion and heartburn. That's why it's wise to keep Tums handy. Tums quickly neutralize excess acid, settle and soothe your stomach. In a jiffy, you're feeling fine again. You'll like Tums' fresh, minty taste. You'll love the speedy, sweet relief they give. And talk about thrifty, Tums are still only 10 cents a roll. The big economy box contains 12 10 cent rolls, costs only a dollar. Take Tums. Take Tums. Tums for the tummy. Don't let acid indigestion get you down. Get Tums. Tums for the tummy. Always keep that handy little roll around. Eat what you like, don't let heartburn strike, get T-U-M-S, Tums. Well, Frank, that was a great story tonight and a mighty fine performance, and I certainly hope it will be fair warning to everybody against one of the dirtiest rackets in our country today. Well, Don, that's one of the reasons I jumped at the chance to do this yarn. And, of course, it gave me a chance to work again with some of the old radio gang. Michael Ann Barrett, Ann Diamond, George Neese, Paul Fries, Sheldon Leonard, and, of course, my wife, Joan Banks. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks again, Frank. Frank Lovejoy will soon be seen starring in Retreat Hell, a Milton Sperling production for Warner Brothers. Tonight's play was written especially for Mr. Lovejoy by Maurice Zim, with music composed and conducted by Jeff Alexander. The entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. And now in just 30 seconds, we'll meet Mr. Joseph Cotton, the star of next week's thrilling play. Laxative users by the millions say, I'm enjoying life again since switching to Nature's Remedy, better known as NR Tablets. NR Tablets are all vegetable, give gentle, thorough relief every time. Do not contain harsh, habit-forming drugs or phenol derivatives, which too often require ever-increasing amounts. Try NR Tablets, plain or candy-coated, and just see how fine you feel. Only 25 cents a box. You're delighted or your money back. NR tonight, tomorrow, all right. Now here transcribed is the star of next week's Tom's Hollywood Theater, Mr. Joseph Cotton. Slowly I climbed the stairs, step by step in pitch darkness. The Paris police guarded the streets outside, but I climbed the stairs alone, knowing he was up there waiting for me. The man the world had killed and buried. The man on the third floor. Thanks, Joe. The man on the third floor sounds like one of the best for next week. <laughs> On tonight's program, all characters and incidents were fictitious. Any similarity to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Now this is Don Wilson saying good night and reminding you that night and day at home or away, always carry Tums. T-U-M-S, Tums for the tummy. Coming up next, Bob Hope brings you mirth and music on NBC. NBC.